very special pleasure to be here with you in Chelsea. And like all of you, I'm looking forward very eagerly to the performance of the Moises Kaufman play 33 Variations this afternoon. Um, it's an extraordinary experience, actually, to reflect on the fact that a number of years ago, not so many years ago, the play began in our living room in Champaign, Illinois. Uh, when Moises Kaufman, having approached me and sent me an email out of the blue when I was traveling with my wife Catherine, who's uh, in the back corner there. Catherine, why don't you stand up for a second? After all, in Catherine's honor that the uh, main character, the musicologist, is named Catherine Grant. So, Moises Kaufman, the successful playwright in New York, um, as he describes it, he became fascinated with a rather paradoxical and surprising situation bearing on Ludwig van Beethoven, this famous composer, who, in the later stages of his life, the period around 1819, 1820, up to 1823, when Beethoven is at the peak of his creative powers, he's working on pieces like the very last piano sonatas, the Mrs. Solemnis, the famous Ninth Symphony with the Choral Finale, and other works. At the same time, grappling with some personal challenges, virtually complete deafness. The last 10 years of his life, Beethoven was so deaf that he could only communicate with friends and colleagues if they wrote down their side of the conversation. Therefore, we're extremely well informed about details of his personal life in this period. From hearings over the custody of his nephew in the courthouses of the time, to the kind of fish he preferred, and to his attitudes about politics, which were quite subversive in the context of the suppressive environment of metronics regime in Austria at that time. Mm. And it's at this point then that Beethoven receives an invitation, and that's how the play actually starts with an invitation from the publisher composer Anton Diabelli, whom Beethoven had known for some years. Beethoven knew Diabelli because Diabelli was not only a composer of lighter works, especially for guitar, but he was also involved in the music publishing business, which is how Diabelli kind of earns money. And he was successful enough in that vein that at this time, 1819, Diabelli decided as a networking project, he would write a waltz of his own invention and send it around to about 50 of the best known composers in the Austrian Empire and ask each of them to write one variation on his walls. <laughs> and he would publish them all together as a collective project. Like such projects, I mean, there's a commercial dimension to this. Uh, he wanted to draw them into his publishing firm, make his own endeavor better known to the musical and public community. And indeed, he did that. And so he approached Beethoven. Now, Beethoven's initial response to this from the reports we have, was skeptical. Mm -hmm. We do indeed have one letter from someone later in which Beethoven describes the waltz by Diabelli as a Schusterfleck, which translates as a cobbler's patch. <laughs> and the reports are uh, that in the initial response in 1819 was that, well, Beethoven would decline the offer. This is also built into the very beginning of the play. Uh, not surprising when we think that when Beethoven started his career as a brilliant pianist improviser, that he had written many sets of variations or improvised sets of variations on popular tunes of the day, like popular operatic mm. themes and the like. And he was very proud 20 years earlier around 1802, 
when he wrote two big sets of variations, the so Opus 34 and 35 of the piano, to point out that the themes were by him. Mm -hmm. And in other words, he wasn't using borrowed themes. Mm -hmm. The whole variation set, including the theme itself, was his own. Mm -hmm. And then, for a long stretch, he rarely writes such variations on given themes or whatever. So, insisted on his own original basis as the springboard for on the variations he would write. Now, that means that the Diabelli variations, in their uh, final finished form, is a great exception to Beethoven's trend. When he decides, well, after all, he's going to take an interest in Diabelli's theme after all, and then write not one, but quite a lot, and eventually 33 variations of this waltz. In other words, create his largest work for piano, uh, what has been described as a microcosm of his art altogether, a piece of immense scope lasting nearly an hour in performance, uh, and a piece which, as we'll see, has perhaps the largest aesthetic scope of any single composition he created. We'll return to that in a few minutes. Um, but to set the scene, let me um, now say just a little bit about our experience with Moises, who's become a good friend, and this play that started in our living room a number of years ago. And also a theme that is very important for Beethoven as well, as for Moises Paul. That is the relationship of art and life. Art and life. In what ways can the artwork serve as a vessel for presenting and reflecting and preserving essential aspects that um, have the visceral, direct quality, the colorful, um, messy qualities of, of our spontaneous life experience. And we know that this was very much a subject for Beethoven. We'll find evidence for that in this extraordinary set of transformations of the Adelis walls. Well, <clears throat> Moises Kaufman also has gotten infected by that. He himself says what drew him to the project originally was the notion of obsession. The, the question, why would Beethoven, at the height of his creative powers, uh, at the same time virtually still deaf and, and increasingly isolated socially, have decided against his initial inclination to write this vast edifice of variations that eventually took four years to complete on a modest, banal, some would even call it a trivial theme uh, of Diabelli's that he described himself as a, a copper scratch. Why was that? How did that happen? And so this is the question that is a, is a matter of obsession for the central character of the play, Catherine Brand. And she is in the present in New York. And so one group of characters here are in the present when the first act takes place on the east coast of the United States. Now she is a, she regards herself as a musicologist. In other words, who was a musicologist anyway? Uh, a, a university type, <laughs> professor type person who specializes in the study of uh, especially classical music regarding them historical vein. And then uh, from this perspective, Catherine Brandt, who is depicted as a, as a proud, maybe somewhat haughty figure, <laughs> proud of her status, she is puzzled by Beethoven's action. And so she wants to get to the bottom of this. Why would the great Beethoven have been so interested in Diabelli's apparently trivial waltz. Why is the big question. 
And so, not able to find a proper answer to this research question, she decides, well, she needs to find further evidence. So she plans a trip to Bonn, Germany, Beethoven's birthplace, that small town on the Rhine, um, south of Cologne. Uh, and sure enough, in Bonn, as part of the complex with Beethoven's birth house, there is a significant archive of materials with many of Beethoven's original manuscripts. Now, when Moises was working on his play for a couple of years, he made a trip to Europe at one point, sent me an email, and mentioned that he would be in Germany, and um, I helped facilitate his visit to the Beethoven archive, where normally, uh, to work with the manuscripts, they allow kind of recognized music scholars in. And I told my friends over there, well, look, this is a very interesting and important playwright. He's going to be in your area. Let him see the Wittgenstein sketchbook, as it's called, that, con that contains a lot of this early work and some other sources. And my friends over there were slightly skeptical, but they, they um, did what I asked. And Moises showed up, and um, one, the archivist was there. His name is Michael Ladenburger. And so Moises is there. Michael Ladenburger is kind of watching him very closely, having him wear white gloves to examine the manuscripts and, and making sure he didn't monkey with them too much. And all of this, quite typically, gets reflected and built into the play, as you'll see. Uh, Michael Lautenborger has become Gertie Lautenborger, <laughs> and she is the archivist uh, at the Beethoven Archive. And the manuscripts, the idea of Beethoven's original sketchbooks and manuscripts of the work, which document his struggle with the creative process, devising these variations, finding more and more possibilities in the walls. This is the connecting line between the two temporal levels of the play. Because as we've seen, one of them is in the present, but one of them is back to the period around 1820, and Beethoven himself is an important character. So we've got Beethoven, <coughs> and we've got Beethoven's assistant, his name is Anton Diabelli, another Anton. I mean, Anton Schindler, sorry, I missed it. And then we've got Anton Diabelli, who's the publisher. So there are, it's a configuration altogether of seven characters, seven figures. And uh, four of them in the present, three of them are back around 1820. The manuscripts are actually a connecting element, and they're Gerti Lagenburger as the German archivist is an important figure. And she also picks up the certain Germanic reserve of our friend Michael Lautenborger, being kind of reserved and skeptical at first, but just like our friend Michael Lautenborger uh, at the Beethoven House, she actually has a wonderful humanity and sense of humor, and that emerges as the play unfolds. It's definitely in Act Two, as you'll see. So anyway, the. The gist of this is that Moises Kaufman himself is fascinated by the interplay between life and art. And there's a certain um, transparency that arises. You also find my name, Kindermann, surfaces at one point um, because uh, Gerti Lombard will say, well, you're only allowed in here because uh, Kindermann recommended it. Which is another thing. And then, then, um, because my, uh, my dear wife, Catherine, sitting there, also had good advice from Moises when he was editing the play, working on different versions, adding and subtracting from the text. Um, I think partly for that reason, and because the kind of activity that, that Catherine Grant was involved in uh, reminded Moises of, I guess, the activities of both of us. Um, the character who is kind of doing what I did for my dissertation <laughs> and my first book in the Deeply Versions is named Catherine. Mm -hmm. And Catherine has been played by a very
very well by a series of actresses. Uh, Mary Beth Hale, who's also a skilled singer, was the first, first captain we experienced. A uh, very fine performer at the uh, premiere also in Washington, D.C. When the play went to Broadway, I think perhaps also for reasons of uh, drawing in the audiences, there was a concern to bring in a very famous name. Indeed, they found that when Jane Fonda came out of retirement <laughs> to play the role in New York also in the Los Angeles production. And we're looking forward eagerly to the enthusiastic reports we've heard uh, about Michelle Mountain as playing that role here. Uh, one challenge, of course, of the Catherine role is also now the presence or the awareness of the transience of life. Now, this mm -hmm. is a very important theme, and it's a parallel. It connects Beethoven in the 1820s with Catherine Brand in the present. Because both of them are involved in the race against time. And the reason for this is illness. Mm -hmm. uh, Catherine Brand has Lou Gehrig's disease, or ALS, and so she has very limited time to pursue this quest into the meaning of this fascinating puzzle that she in the deep Beethoven himself, as the 1820s unfolded, we've learned more about this just in recent years. Um, after 1821, Beethoven knew that he was severely ill. <clears throat> and the liver disease that eventually took his life in 1827 had already <clears throat> progressed. Um, and so entirely apart from the loss of his hearing, Beethoven knew that he had limited time, and yet, then, now this brings us to this fascinating paradox, that Beethoven finds that out of the realm of the commonplace, available to all of us, that there is a seemingly unlimited source of artistic material. And so it's at this point, with that much as an introduction, that I'd like to turn to the work itself and make some observations not just about the configuration of the play, but the music that has been its inspiration. And of course, this is very relevant to the play itself, too, because you will hear in the course of the play about two-thirds of the variations either played fully and live in performance, or at least parts of them. And so, actually, one can say that in addition to the seven human characters, there's another main character in the play, and that is being the music. And if you uh, consider this, say, from the perspective of a game like chess, in chess one says, well, a, a knight or a bishop is worth, say, three pawns. A rook would be worth five, queen, nine. Um, as, as if you consider that each of the figures uh, counts for uh, a unity, then maybe the music of Beethoven is at least three figures worth. But the central driving factor is the Schusterfleck, the couplet pass. So let's consider that for a minute. This is how it's in. <laughs> Uh, in other words, a patch, a 
piece. And then to get it to go further, you just shove all the voices up a notch. Mm -hmm. And then you shove them up another notch. Um, and this is very familiar device, especially in kind of popular music idioms, all times and places. So it's an easy kind of direct, sometimes facile way of creating more music. You just take a patch and then you shove it up. Less often you shove it down. Um, um, but this, from Beethoven's higher artistic perspective, is sort of too easy a solution. So he, he would have seen at once, oh, the sequences here are just published patch sequences. And another thing, what else might Beethoven have found to be less than totally refined are totally realized. Well, probably this. Or 
variation 11. Uh, 
actually offer an answer to why the work became so large and comprehensive. And what it was that Beethoven saw as a creative possibility here. Namely, that if the Diabelli waltz was not aesthetically perfect, in a way that was an asset, drawing it out of the commonplace, I mean, with the both the characteristic features and the characteristic defects of ordinary objects, that meant that Beethoven could not only ennoble and transform the walls, he could also poke fun at it. And so there can be a huge range of character ranging from the sublime to the ridiculous, a Shakespearean range. And so we also, one discovery I made studying the sketches, I mean the act, very activity that Catherine Grant is doing in the play, was to discover that actually uh, when Beethoven tackled this piece and got obsessed with the walls in 1819, he first made a draft with 23 of the 33 eventual variations. And that draft encompassed the whole projected work down to the end. But he didn't quite have the finale in place, and certain key variations were simply missing. They weren't there. And then when you see which variations he added, there's some kind of illumination that comes from seeing which ones were late. Because several of them are very closely linked to the original waltz and to the features that Beethoven had avoided in his initial chain of variations. Like the very first one, number one, the Maestosa. <laughs> Transformations in the entire set, 
which is the fugetta, it sounds like this. Pianistic virtuosity that fits in here 
Paris and Mozart operas um, juxtaposed with, um, with Beethoven's ironic relationship to the original cobbler's patch. And now, right after these variations comes that variation 25, this one. If we reflect on that, what happens with that one? The very next variation goes like this. symbol 
And, and yet the interesting thing in this connection, because you're wondering now, why am I talking so long about this other piece, mm -hmm. uh, is one thinks of the, of the opening of the Arietta theme. the 
original wow. of the walls across an hour of music. <laughs> uh, so it's a gesture something like, I, I'd interpret it this way. Of course, the ending of the work is also open. It's stuck it, it, on what should be a weak beat. And it alludes to the middle of the ability, not the end. Mm. It, um, so it's as if, with the long gaze backward, the open ending, Beethoven conveys something like, well, there you have it. <laughs> but it could have been even more. As <laughs> this often even makes no physical playing music, Beethoven, at one point in the end, when he has the, uh, uh, there's a, a scene with Catherine, the musicologist near the end, and, and in that general context, Beethoven says, that's all I could have used in another couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> and, this kind of thing. and so this brings us back to the intersection of life and art. And maybe um, some of this is reflected in the play in a very important scene um, when she hallucinates. Because naturally, from what I've described in the play, this reflects aspects of the work, too, because we've been talking recently about some historical references that are built to the work. Right? So that means that there's a gap in time, a gap in time of many decades, say, between box works and, and Beethoven's response to that. So then in um, the uh, structure of the play, Intriguing is how Beethoven's situation parallels that of Catherine Brin. And, of course, other characters are involved in this as well. One strategy, by the way, this is a little aside, but you'll find that this play is structured so that to find your way into its inner workings, you can choose other figures if you like, and they'll lead you in as well. Some of you, for instance, if you if classical music is not your thing, uh, then pay close attention to Mike. Mike is the uh, nurse, the male nurse, who is then becomes the partner of the daughter, Clara. And and in order to court Clara, then he invites her out to a classical music concert, and he says, "Well, this sounds like classical music to me." <laughs> and, but he, he's very awkwardly concerned that it work for her, and, but he, he can't relate to it very easily, um, and yet is drawn increasingly into that world by stages. And now, the, the historical dimension, this uh, is resting in the play, especially in the, the parallel between Catherine Brandt and Beethoven. And you'll notice at the end of Act One, when she undergoes this disturbing uh, medical examination, um, Beethoven appears at the end to lend spiritual support. Mm -hmm. And then in Act Two, as a kind of development of that motive, she hallucinates and Beethoven appears and they have an extended dialogue. Uh -huh. And she's at first awkward about this. She says, oh, I don't like this. This is unbecoming in a scholar. <laughs> <laughs> and then made up her mind. It could have been worse. It could have been Tchaikovsky. <laughs> and then she says, How do you know Tchaikovsky? He was after you. And then made up and says something like, Oh, we're all here in limbo together. And God is unhappy with us. And made up and complains about the angelic music. <laughs> and then even says, Oh, Makes me wish I was deaf again. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so as you see, there are very funny things that are incorporated into what is otherwise a pretty great situation for the character Catherine. Very, very Beethovenian stuff, actually, um, in which you have this sharp dualism of levels uh, and that contributes to the comprehensiveness. And to the notion, and what's the play ultimately about? What does Catherine learn? What does she discover? 
This is conveyed in part at the very end. In the lecture, she's been preparing for her colleagues, but she doesn't live to deliver it. Her daughter, Clara, delivers it. And there's also an interesting twist in this. I see my uh, dear wife, Catherine, because when we were in New York on one occasion, and Catherine was giving a lecture at a musical gathering, Moises Kaufman uh, was then casting for Macbeth in Central Park. Very busy. He said, well, when is your lecture? He wanted to go to her lecture at all costs. And this was quite possible to us. Why would he want to do that? And then we had breakfast with him the next day. And that's when we, around that time that we found out that there was this main character in the play who had been named Catherine. And the reason surely he went to the lecture was that the play concludes with this lecture being given, written by Catherine, but delivered by Clara. And in that, Catherine explains that her initial thesis um, or puzzlement over the discrepancy, in other words, that this great composer, how could he have wasted his time, so to speak? In, uh, on this project of writing so many transformations on this waltz that he apparently disdained. Mm -hmm. uh, that that response was actually incomplete. It wasn't completely wrong, but it missed an important aspect in that uh, part of the secret is this capacity for recognizing with full engagement and sympathy, the presence of aspects in the present, in the commonplace, which then allow for transformation into a vast number of contexts and shapes. And with this kind of openness of viewpoint, that then is the attitude that nourishes the creativity that produces works like the Diabelli variations. And that it's not at all divorced from what we might describe as a compassion in human terms. And in that sense, it's Catherine who has learned in the process of the play an increased insight and compassion also into the capacity and the potential for her own daughter. And hence, and in that sense, the mother-daughter relationship is quite central. Um, now, Beethoven uh, often uh, quoted a particular saying that derives from antiquity. If you had spent time with him around this time in 1820, you would have heard him quoted. Uh, he would have said it in Latin, Ars longa vita brevis, which translates as Ars longa. Life is short. And that's, of course, also uh, an element here that the work of art expands with its foundation in real life. It expands, it could expand even further because there are no artificial limits to the creative project. It ultimately becomes what it can and is then a gift to others. And I think that this, uh, it's maybe with this thought that Beethoven embraced fervently that I'll close my remarks because I've overstayed my allotted time and I would very much like to also allow